Welcome to the Sports Scouting Report Podcast with Lee Brickeen. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Brickeen. I hope everybody's having a great Monday all around the United States, especially Louisiana. Um, the Super Bowl is going to be our topic today. Obviously, a lot of people will be talking about the Super Bowl. Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl. I actually wanted Tampa Bay to win. I wanted Brady to get one more championship, seven, unbelievable, seven total. And also, Leonard Fournette, we're going to talk about Leonard Fournette. I've got a Leonard Fournette story. And also talk about Devin White, linebacker from LSU, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And we're also going to talk about the LSU baseball team. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about the hitters, the outfield and the infield. And catcher, man, the potential this LSU baseball team has in 2021 is off the charts. I think on paper, this is the best pulmonary team that he's ever had on paper. Now, they won a national championship, and then they lost a national championship against Florida not too long ago. And he's been in a couple of other World Series Um, in Omaha where he had a couple other great teams. I think he's had about seven great teams. He's won one national championship. This this is a national championship type of team. We'll talk about the hitters that they have coming back. Next week, we'll talk about the pitchers. Um, But just want to talk about, go ahead and talk about the Super Bowl. And for whoever's listening to the show, I thought it would be a very close game, you know, before the game was played. I thought that Tampa Bay's defense was the real deal. I really did think that was the case. And, you know, obviously Kansas City's offense was the best offense in the NFL. That defense for Tampa Bay, led by Devin White, shut them down. I mean, they they made them do dunk and donks, you know, underneath and they wouldn't wouldn't give up the big play and that's what Patrick Holmes is known for give you know getting those big plays and it just didn't work out Tampa Bay had a phenomenal game plan and that offensive line for Tampa Bay was dominant and Leonard Fournette had a phenomenal game and you know what's really crazy about the Super Bowl think about this the New Orleans Saints beat Tampa Bay twice during the season. Take that in. The New Orleans Saints beat Tampa Bay twice. They're in the New Orleans Saints. They're in the same division. They not only beat them twice during the season, but they beat them by four touchdowns the first time. Now, that was early in the season. That's when Fournette and Gronk and Tom Brady and and all these great players before they were gelling. And I mentioned that on our show about three months ago. So, you know, this team's going to become a very good team once they're all in sync. And we all saw that. We all saw what happens when a team comes together. And the greatest player in the history of pro football, Tom Brady, wins a Super Bowl at the age of 43. That's incredible. Isn't that incredible? That he looks like he's 33 and not 43. The way he throws the football underneath and the the arm strength he has down the field to throw those 50-yard passes or 40-yard passes on a line. Now, it doesn't hurt to have a ton of players around you, but he helped recruit these guys, so he gets the credit. He helped get Leonard Fournette and, and Gronk at tight end and you know, all the receivers that they have. I mean, in the O-line, he helped get these guys. He helped build the team, actually, like a player coach. Kind of like what Peyton Manning did in Denver. You know, when Peyton Manning went to Denver to help them win a Super Bowl, he helped build that team. You know, they consulted and said, Peyton, who do we need to get at receiver and running back to help the Broncos win a, nat- uh, uh, a Super Bowl? And they did. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen a 43-year-old quarterback play at this level. And I remember growing up as a kid, and I'm sure a lot of my listeners would probably agree, but Joe Montana was one of my favorite quarterbacks. But when he hit the age of 37, 36, he was basically done. Dan Marino, when he was about 30, 
five, thirty six. He was basically done. You know, Michael Vick was was kind of done at the age of thirty two. You know, uh, Sims at the Giants. He was done in his early mid thirties. Just done. You know, all these great quarterbacks were just done before the age of 40. I mean, they lost they either lost their arm strength. They just lost that competitive ability to compete at a high level. And, and this guy's got so much talent left. It's incredible. They can go back and win this thing again. But it's really crazy that the New Orleans Saints dominated them and beat them twice. Now, they did beat the Saints in the third game in the playoffs at in New Orleans, and I still will say this, if there would have been a crowd-packed house in New Orleans, if it wasn't for Corona, and it's always something for the Saints, right? There's that flag call against the Rams. Uh, with Against the Rams, it got the Rams to the Super Bowl when, in the in a, NFC Championship that was played in New Orleans, remember? And then there was that last Hail Mary pass or touchdown in the last one minute of the game against Minnesota in the playoffs the year before that. And now with the coronavirus, if I'm telling you, I really believe this. If the Superdome would have had capacity fans against the Buccaneers, I think the Saints would have won the game. It gives you that extra juice, and you can't hear the plays coming in. Brady and them, they would have had trouble. It's just always something with the Saints. It's, it's the worst luck I've seen for a pro organization three years in a row. I've never, I mean, it's incredible. But anyway, Tampa Bay wins the Super Bowl. They beat the young Phenom and Patrick Mahomes. And you know what's crazy? Is that LSU played Texas Tech in that Texas Bowl in Houston a few years ago, and they played Patrick Mahomes. And that was a, remember that was a thriller to watch? It was like, I can't remember the final score, but LSU had to score in the in the 40s to beat them, and they scored almost 30 points. And Mahomes just kept pulling out great plays after great plays. And I think that's what got him drafted really high. And, and Devin White was on that team for LSU. He went against Mahomes in college in that bowl game. He was a young, a young player in that game, and then they had a few guys – that, that were in this game that were actually a, a part of the college football scene that went against Mahomes. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to tell a story about Leonard Fournette, Tyron Matthew, and Devin White, all players that I watched in high school. I thought I would share some stories with the uh, listening audience. We'll come back, and then after that, we're going to talk some LSU baseball. We're going to talk about the top hitters on the LSU baseball team. Obviously, it's going to be a tough uh, season with a great team. There's a lot of great SEC teams again this year. But we're going to talk LSU baseball, too, later in the show. We'll be right back. Listen, whatever you're driving right now, Tommy Harvey wants it. Bring it in to Harvey Subaru, Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City, or John Harvey Toyota. They're paying big bucks for all trades right now. They'll cut you a check right there. Tell them Lee sent you. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. We're going to continue with our topic, the Super Bowl. I want to start with a Leonard Fournette story to tell you what kind of kind of guy he is. Um, we called Leonard Fournette when he was in high school to come down to Baton Rouge and take a picture on the cover of our magazine, and he was so nice. And when he came down, he was one of the nicest, most humble kids in the, in, that you'll ever meet. He was a Parade All-American in high school. He's one of the top two or not. I think he was one of the top five players in the country. I thought he was the best player in the country coming out of senior year out of St. Augustine High School in New Orleans, the Purple Knights. But Leonard came down, and he was one of the nicest, quietest young men that you'll ever meet. For a guy that had dominated the high school scene and was – getting recruited by Alabama, LSU, all the big schools, Ohio State, Michigan, Notre Dame, Penn State, you name it, USC, everybody wanted Leonard Fournette, University of Texas, Oklahoma, you name it. He had a scholarship offer from every college in the country. And I remember watching Leonard Fournette in high school, going back to his freshman season, and not many freshmen started 
in high school at St. Aug because they're so deep on talent at that school. You usually have to play when you're a junior or a sophomore. But I remember his senior year. It might have been his junior year, but his senior or junior year, I'm in Lafayette, and I'm at St. Thomas More High School in the playoffs. And St. Augustine was at St. Thomas More, and they were playing the advance to the semis, and it was basically Leonard Fournette against St. Thomas More. I mean, he had over 250 yards rushing on 40 carries, three or four touchdowns. And it's one of those games where the fans, they see this kid play from the other team, and they just have the ultimate respect for a player when you lose. You know, usually you lose a game, they forget about the opposing team, but everybody was in awe of Leonard Fournette's ability. Your jaw would drop watching him play, whether they won, won or lost. And here's, here's a guy, Leonard Fournette, I'm so happy for him. Because he didn't play in a state championship in high school. And all those phenomenal seasons he had at St. Aug, he had over 8,000 yards rushing, you know, over 80 touchdowns. But they never played in a state championship. And then he gets to LSU, and they couldn't beat Alabama. And he couldn't he, – he didn't play in a, uh, a national championship. So he didn't play in a championship when he was in college. Or in high school. And here he goes to the NFL, and he, he's drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars, first round. He has a phenomenal rookie year. He looked like the coming of Jim Brown. And then his second year, he had a lot of injuries in Jacksonville, and Jacksonville traded all their good players off, so the team was horrible. And going into the third year, this year, he got cut by Jacksonville. And I was really, I was upset for, for Leonard. You know, when you get cut and you go from being the rookie of the year, your, your rookie year with Jacksonville, I mean, he had an 85-yard touchdown run at Pittsburgh, which is still a record today. The longest run that the Steelers have ever given up. To see him picked up by Tampa Bay because of Tom Brady, it's just so remarkable to get to see him have a second chance on life and to get a Super Bowl win and to win a championship. Like I said, he, he didn't play for a championship at LSU, and he didn't play for one at St. Aug in high school. And then you look at Devin White, who went to North Webster High School in Spring Hill, the old Spring Hill High School. Devin White was a running back, a story to tell everybody. When we come back, I'll talk about Devin White when we come back and Tyron Matthew back when they were in high school. And then we're going to talk about the LSU baseball team. We'll be right back. Looking for a used car? Harvey Artos has three dealerships, which means three times the used vehicles. They've got everything from fuel-efficient compacts to luxury models, even hybrids, and certified pre-owned with a warranty. Check out John Harvey Toyota, Harvey Subaru, or Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City. Before I get into talking about Devin White and his high school days at North Webster High School before LSU, I want to give a plug to our great sponsor, John Harvey Toyota. Looking for a used car? Harvey Autos has three car dealerships, which means three times the used vehicles. They've got everything from fuel-efficient compacts to luxury models, even hybrids, and certified pre-owned with a warranty Check out John Harvey Toyota, Harvey Subaru, or Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City, Louisiana. Check them out. They're great people, great supporters of what we do, and they support high school, college football uh, throughout Louisiana, especially in Bossier City, Shreveport, Caddo, Natchitoches area, and Ruston, those areas. But want to get back to talking about LSU former football players from the Super Bowl. Get back to talk about Devin White. You know, Devin was a running back in high school, and he played some linebacker, but he was mostly a running back for Coach Ware. And, you know, when you watch this guy run, he looked like a Herschel Walker in high school. You know, those big arms that Devin has and those tree trunk legs and his athletic ability. I really wanted him to carry the ball at LSU. I, I was hoping they would put him in on goal line, but they never – 
they never did. I mean, I was hoping that Les Miles would put him in, but I, but I think they were scared if they put him in at running back, he'd never go back to linebacker because he could have been an All-American running back at LSU, just, just as good as him being an, a Buckus Award winner linebacker. But Devin White, when he was in high school at North Webster, he dominated the high school scene as a running back. And, and another great kid, we, I remember when we called Devin White, and I called him in May of his senior year to come take a picture for the cover of the magazine, Louisiana Football Magazine. And Devin showed up. The picture was taken in Lafayette. It was actually taken at a high school in Lafayette. St. Thomas Moore High School is where we took the picture that year. And when Devin showed up, I asked him, I said, Devin, man, where, did your parents bring you? He said, no, sir, I drove myself. I said, you drove yourself? He said, yeah, man, I'm, I drive everywhere. It's no big deal. He was like a 25-year-old at 17. In maturity, you just knew, not just athletic talent, you just knew, I just knew back then watching him on film that he was going to be a great player, but his maturity was off the charts. I mean, this kid drove for three hours to come take a picture for the cover of our magazine. He said it was important to him. We thanked him. Very quiet guy, but when he spoke, you heard him. And, you know, just such a great kid. And he was on the cover of our magazine, and I'd picked him as one of the top players in the state. Another player from that game, obviously Tyron Matthew from St. Augustine, the same high school as Leonard Fournette. I had a chance to watch Tyron play when he was a sophomore at St. Aug, and and I'll never forget it was one of the greatest games I'd ever seen in my life. I think it was McDonough 35 they were playing. And I had somebody film the game that we paid. Back then, I was filming games, and I was breaking games down for LSU. Um, Going in from Nick Saban, I did it for Nick Saban, and then the first two years for Les Miles, before there were analysts, before you had personnel directors, I was basically doing that for them for Louisiana. I would film all the games a year in advance, two years in advance, break it down, rank them, and give the information to the LSU coaches before they would go out on the road in May. And I did that for six years for LSU. And I'm the one that filmed the game of Tyron Matthew back then. We filmed about seven games, actually, at St. Aug during that era, which involved Chad Jones later on and Raheem Aleem and and also several other players in the NFL right now. Trey Turner, we we were able to supply the LSU with the film of Trey Turner from St. Aug, who's an all-pro offensive guard who blocked for Leonard Fournette. But when, when Tyron Matthew was at St. Aug, this game, he had a punt return for a touchdown. He had a pick six for a touchdown. He had 13 tackles and five behind the line. And he was only about five foot eight at that time, about 160. And this was his sophomore year. And you know, not many guys five eight, 160, you say, man, that kid's going to be a great player. When you see Tyron Matthew play his first play in high school like I did, it was like this guy is going to be phenomenal. I mean, he was a sophomore in high school. He made plays. He reacted on the ball and made plays you just don't see from sophomores. And you knew he was going to get a little bit bigger, which he did. You know, he got up to 5'9", about one. What is he playing now? I think 180 pounds now. And they gave him the nickname, the Honey Badger. I saw him do Honey Badger stuff in high school. You could. This is not something that came along in college. This was in high school. And those that are listening to this that saw him play would agree with me. But he did some incredible stuff in high school. And his ability to read and react. And actually, he looked a lot faster in high school. He was a lot faster in high school. And, and you know, he's getting older now, but... He's still a quick player. He had that interception that was that was called back last night in the Super Bowl. And I know he was upset because he's a competitor. You know, I mean, and I'm sure him and Brady are okay now. They were just they're just big time competitors. I love to see guys compete like that that care, you know? That it matters you give up a touchdown. It matters. 
instead of just walk off the field like no big deal. Let's go ahead and take a break. When we come back, let's talk some LSU baseball. And we're going to talk LSU baseball when we come back. We'll be right back. So, hey, guys, just wanted to take a minute to tell you about Harvey Autos. If you need a new or used car, there's three great dealerships right here worth checking out. John Harvey Toyota, Harvey Subaru, and Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City. Low prices, honest people. Tell them Lee sent you. Welcome back. You listen to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Before we talk about LSU baseball, I want to give my three cents about the Saints. They're in, a, they're in a dilemma right now. I mean, they're in the same conference with Tampa Bay. Carolina, who's got, who's got a lot of talent. They just need a quarterback. Carolina does. And then you have Atlanta, who's very talented. Will Matt Ryan come back to Atlanta? Will Atlanta get a new quarterback? Will, will Atlanta try and get another veteran just to have a, a change, just to get rid of just – let, just let Matt Ryan go somewhere else, just a change for both parties? Will Bridgewater stay in Carolina? But I'm going to tell you, this is going to be a juggernaut for the Saints. I mean, Tampa Bay is going to get better and better and better. They're just going to add more and more players. And, look, the Saints have a great team. If Drew Brees retires, which it looks like Drew's going to retire, what are they going to do at quarterback? If I'm the Saints, here's my opinion. Let me just throw this out to the listening audience. If I'm the Saints, I trade up for Zach Wilson, the quarterback from Brigham Young. Because Zach's not really a top three pick, but he'll go in the top ten picks. So the Saints are going to have to trade up to get uh, Zach Wilson. They don't have a top ten pick. But, I mean, it's now. You know, you got to get off the pot and get a young future quarterback. And here's the thing. If you get one in the top ten picks, he might not be your starter next year, but he'll be your starter the following year. So you still need a veteran quarterback for this year. Is that going to be Jameis Winston? Are they going to let Jameis sign with another team? Are they going to pick up another veteran quarterback? I think they will. But the thing about this quarterback situation, you want a long-term quarterback, you either need to get one in the draft and trade up and get Zach Wilson. The reason I say Zach Wilson from Brigham Young is because he fits the Saints' offense. He's 6'3", about 220. He can run. He can throw. He can, he can do the spread. He's, he's phenomenal. I think he's got a lot of Joe Burrow ability. Or you can get Kyle Trask in round two and trade up for get Kyle Trask, I think would be a great quarterback because for a big guy, he reminds me of Ben Rossenberger from the Steelers. And remember when the Steelers went out to the Miami of Ohio to get Rossenberger? He wasn't a big name coming out of college. Remember when Buffalo Bills drafted Josh Allen out of Wyoming? Nobody knew about Josh Allen at Wyoming. I watched him in college, but the Saints either have to find a sleeper quarterback or they need to trade up for a quarterback. And another quarterback they could trade up for would be North Dakota State's Trey Lance, who's 6'4", 225, runs a 4'5", 40, He's also a dual-threat guy that's not just a runner, but a great passer. He's won two national championships at North Dakota State. He's a phenomenal talent. He's a redshirt junior draft-eligible quarterback. I don't think Justin Fields from Ohio State is ready. I really don't. I think he's going to take a, it's going to take him a couple of years to get ready. I'm not a big fan of Mac Jones as a pro. I thought Mac Jones was a great college player around all that talent at Alabama. But I don't think Mac Jones is going to be a good pro. Trevor Lawrence is going to be one of the first two picks of the draft, if not the first pick. So they're not going to get Trevor Lawrence. And, and the sleeper in this whole thing, they could get this guy in round three, is Ian Book. Ian Book looks like another Drew Brees. Nobody wanted... Drew Brees out of college from Purdue, six foot tall. I didn't. I don't want to say nobody. I'm just saying not in the first round, not high in the draft. This Ian Book kid, six foot tall, 190 pounds, just like Drew. Great little guy, great great thrower. I think he's a sleeper for the NFL. Bama let him look bad, but other than that, he dominated all the college football at a high level at Notre Dame. 
and he's one of the greatest quarterbacks I've seen with his feet and his arm. I think Ian Book's going to be a heck of a pro quarterback. I really do. He might go round four or round three, but that's a guy that the Saints could get and develop. You know, it might take him a year, but he might be the next Drew Brees type of quarterback at that size. He's got some special talent. And Notre Dame did not have the talent that Alabama had or Clemson or not even LSU or Ohio State. Probably not even as much talent, if you even want to, if you want to get down to it, as Florida or Texas A&M. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the LSU baseball team and the phenomenal hitters they have for this coming season. You're going to want to hear this segment and share. I want to share all this with the listening audience. I've got a lot of baseball scout friends, a lot of people that have their uh, nose to the ground, and they, they keep up with the baseball team. <clears throat> so I want to share what I've heard from a lot of the scouts that I know in baseball, and a lot of baseball people that go to practice uh, talk about this recruiting class that's coming in and what's coming back. And I've seen a lot of these guys play, and I saw a film on all the guys they signed, too, that are coming in. I want to go ahead and come talk about that LSU baseball, the hitters. We'll be right back. Parents, are you looking for advice on getting your high school athlete recruited by the right college? Lee Brakeen is your answer. Lee has been doing it for over 30 years. He knows the ropes, and more importantly, he knows the people. Lee offers turnkey service from evaluation, creating highlight tapes in the correct format, and complete guidelines for effective communication with the schools. No matter the sport, Girl or boy, no matter what grade your child is in, let Lee Brakeen help match your child to the right college fit. Go to our website, lafootballmagazine.com, and get connected today. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Brakeen. Before we go to LSU baseball, I want to tell an Alan Fanica story, and I want to congratulate Alan Fanica being in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He's going to be inducted this summer. And if you don't know the history of Alan Fanica prior to LSU, that's what I want to share with the listening audience. Seven Pro Bowls in his career with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Incredible career. I think Alan Fanica is the best offensive guard that I've ever seen play football. Prior to LSU, he was in Houston, Texas at Lamar Consulate, Lamar High School there. He was lineman of the year, touchdown club player of the year, which you very rarely give to a lineman in Texas or Louisiana. Allen was, you know, 6'4", about 285, and he was phenomenal in high school. He wasn't, like, one of the top 50 players in the state, but he was one of the top 150 guys. He was a big get for LSU. But here's the history of Alan Fanica. But prior to Houston, Texas, Alan grew up in New Orleans, and he went to John Curtis High School. That's right. Alan Fanica went to John Curtis High School earlier in his high school career. His mom and dad were from New Orleans, and his mom moved to Houston, and so did Alan. And I I got to know Alan's dad when Alan was at LSU. Alan's dad actually – Worked at Exxon for a little bit, worked here, or did some plant work, was in construction, and really had a chance to get to know Alan's dad. I met Alan a few times, too, when he was here at LSU through his dad. And what I remember about Alan, he was such a quiet guy. I mean, really quiet, reserved. You know, basically not very talkative, but you could tell when he got on that field, he became a different dude. He finished tackles. I mean, this guy dominated college football, and he was at LSU when they weren't very good. But Allen was a phenomenal player. Day one, when he went to LSU, he was dominating as a true freshman. I mean, he was taking D linemen and just flattening them all over, the, and going after second, third-level players. But Allen Fanica, like I said, he went to high school in Texas, but he started his high school career at John Curtis High School in New Orleans in River Ridge, Louisiana. A lot of people don't know that. I wanted to share that with the listening audience. And I'm so happy for him. He's, he went from 325 to 330 pounds. He's now like 200 pounds or 210. He runs marathons. 
He retired before he was 38, 40 because Mike Webster played too long. We watched that concussion movie, right? He was that was portrayed about Mike Webster dying of all those concussions. Uh, he played, you know, like 18 years. Well, well, Fanica, I think, got out at the right time. He was in his early 30s, and he got out at the right time, I think. You know, and he he had a phenomenal career in Pittsburgh. I'm a big Pittsburgh Steelers fan. But Allen was a phenomenal offensive lineman. And, again, I wanted to share that story because a lot of people don't realize when they – if you have a football card of Allen or you hear where he played high school, they'll say Houston Lamar. Well, John Curtis High School, that's where he's from. His family's from New Orleans, from the River Ridge area. Or you want to – they could have been anywhere from that area, River Ridge or Harahan or any of those places um, to go to John Curtis. But – Allen was raised by his mom in Houston, and his mom and dad were divorced. And his dad moved to Louisiana when he was playing at LSU. He was living out of state, and his mom, um, I don't know if she moved here, but I know that, that, that they, she raised him in Houston, Texas, after they moved from New Orleans, River Ridge area, to go to Houston, Texas. Um, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about LSU baseball, their hitters, the phenomenal lineup they're going to have. We'll be right back. Listen, whatever you're driving right now, Tommy Harvey wants it. Bring it in to Harvey Subaru, Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City, or John Harvey Toyota. They're paying big bucks for all trades right now. They'll cut you a check right there. Tell them Lee sent you. Let's talk about LSU baseball. Welcome back. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. You listen to the Sports Scouting Report. This segment, again, our topic, LSU baseball. I think this LSU baseball team on paper, from a hitting standpoint, pitching, catcher, speed, it has everything. We're not going to talk about pitchers today. We're going to talk about the hitters. You know, hitting's been a problem for the LSU baseball team as a lineup. You know, they've always had a couple of good hitters, even on bad teams for Maneri. But the last two or three years, and even the last five years, you really just, even when Bregman was there, they didn't have a great hitting lineup. But this year you got guys that can play multiple positions coming back and new guys coming in in the infield and outfield. There's a lot of guys that can play the outfield. Infield and DH. So I'm going to throw out a bunch of names, tell you a little bit about them, and tell you how these guys all can play multiple positions. And that's another thing that Maneri lacked was a deep infield. He only had two or three guys. He didn't have any options when things went cold. You know, when somebody couldn't hit it and and, and nobody, the bat was cold, there wasn't anybody to bring in. He'd have his star players and that was it. But this team has competition. And this LSU baseball team, they have players that are going to pe- compete against other players at every position in the outfield, from first base, second, third, shortstop, catcher, DH, left field, right field, center field. And let's start with Zach Arnold. Zach Arnold's going to be a, a sophomore from California, 6'2", 190 pounds. Zach can play second or shortstop, either one. I'll look for the guy to start at one of those two positions this year. And you know that you can look at a, a starting lineup right now, but that's all going to change because if you can't hit the ball and you can't play defense, that's why I'm going over this today. There's going to be several options that Maneri has. You know, the, the, the starting lineup won't get settled in until about 20 games. It's kind of like basketball. Everybody gets a shot to start, and then if you don't get it, you don't get the job done, then somebody's going to take your place. You also have at second and third base, he can play second, third base, as a true freshman from California, Jordan Thompson, who would have went in the first round of the MLB draft, but because of lack of money with Kovic, he's he's in college. He's a true freshman. Zach Arnold's about 6'2". This kid's about 6'1", about 190, and he's a phenomenal glove guy, and he's got power. And Zach Arnold's got power, man. These California kids, these two kids are very – they have very promising futures at LSU. They're big, tall kids that have great bats, and they're very good as infielders. You also have Kay Darty, who played last year as a true freshman from Denham Springs. And Cade can play second or third base. 
And he's become a good – he's a hitter. This is going to be Cade's year. I mean, he was a power hitter in high school. And I think you're going to see the power this year for Cade. You know, freshmen usually don't show all their power early on in, in college baseball. At first base, you're going to have Trey Morgan. Trey Morgan is a freshman from Brother Martin in New Orleans. He's about six foot one, about 195, and he's got a great glove. He's a great defensive guy. He can get the balls out of the dirt. He's got an arm on him. He's athletic. He can hit. Trey Morgan might be the best first baseman, legit first baseman, to have every skill trait since Eddie Furness. Eddie that couldn't run, but Trey can run too. And then you got Collar Cranford, who's a shortstop. Collar Cranford from Zachary. This is his true sophomore year. Had a great year last year for LSU. He's only going to get better. He's got a great glove. And he can hit. He'll be an improved hitter this year, right from Zachary High School. You have a freshman by the name of Will Safford from U High, who will be a shortstop or second baseman. He's only about 5'8", about 170, but he can run. He's got a great glove. Um, he's a, got a good arm on him. <clears throat> Look for Will to be a backup to these guys I'm mentioning, but he could also come in and take their job if they're not hitting well or playing good defense. In the outfield, you got a ton of talent. And here's where it gets confusing. You're going to have a, the guys that don't start in the outfield are going to compete to start at DH. But the starters in the outfield is going to be right field is going to be Dylan Cruz, who's a freshman from Florida. He'll be a first-round pick when he leaves LSU in three years. He's a phenomenal guy at the plate and his defense, his speed. He does everything. He can hit for power. <clears throat> he can hit uh, both sides of the field, left or right field. Dylan Cruz is a guy, again, if the MLB had the money and it wasn't because of corona, the coronavirus, he would have went in the draft and not come to college. Basically, the lack of money is what got this kid to college, and that's another, just, just like Jordan Thompson I mentioned earlier from California. So look for Dylan Cruz to be a, a phenom. He's a guy that you've been seeing like play at Vanderbilt lately, those guys at Vandy and baseball that are so good. Well, LSU's finally got him a phenomenal hitter since Bregman. You know, he's kind of like a Todd Walker. You know, he's got all that, all that, all that stuff. Center field would be a Giovanni. He's a, a a junior from Florida. I think LSU should just wait for this kid to be able to hit. I mean, he runs like a four five forty in football. Um, he's one of the fastest players in college baseball. He's got a great glove, great arm, but he's he just needs to hit. Uh, at left field, you got our, your former starting first baseman is Cade Belisso. Um, Cade is you know played at John Curtis uh, from Texas. You know, six foot tall. He's he's got his weight down from like two thirty to like two ten. He's got a lot of power. This is going to be his year as a junior to really dominate. And he's got a good. He's he can play good defense. I mean, to be a left fielder, you don't have to be a center fielder where you got to get cover a lot of ground, but he's got some height on him. He's a, he's a tough kid. And at catcher, you got Alex Malazzo from Zachary, who's a true sophomore. He's got a great arm. He's got one of the best arms at LSU since probably Bianco, and, and I get, I'm probably missing a few others, but LSU's had a weakness there at catcher as far as throwing people out, stealing bases, and he can, he can do that. He's one of the best in the country, and Malazzo can hit. His backup is going to be Jake Waith, who's a junior college transfer from Texas, former TCU baseball player, about 6'3", big kid, who can also DH. So DH is going to be pretty crowded because you have a lot of backup outfielders that are going to try and start at some point. Mitchell Sanford, a freshman from Berwick, who I watched play quarterback in high school in football. Mitchell 6'2", about 190, got a great, great athletic ability. I know he can run just from football. He's a 4'6 guy in football. Mitchell's an outfielder, but he also he'll compete to, to win the DH spot. Drew Bianco, speaking of Coach Bianco at Ole Miss, former LSU baseball player, Drew will also – he can catch if he needs to. He's an outfielder, and he'll compete at DH. There's Maurice Hampton, the, uh, the great freshman recruit last year from Tennessee that's had str – he struggled in football for LSU – he didn't have a good year in football this year. Um, he struggled as a baseball player his first year, but let's see if he if it comes together. He's got great speed, and 
he just had trouble hitting a fastball. He had trouble like a lot of guys do getting at this level. You also have Gavin Dugas, who's hit two 450-foot home runs in fall practice. The uh, Homa native is an outfielder. He could actually go to infield if somebody got hurt, and he can DH. I think Gavin is the leading candidate to be the DH right now. And then you look at some other kids, Hayden Travazinski, who's a freshman who redshirted last year from Bossier City, from Airline High School. That's where Todd Walker played. He's a kid who can hit it a mile. I mean, he's got great power. He's six foot three, about 240. I mean, he can hit 450-foot home runs, but he's got to get consistent as a hitter. And he's going to try and win that DH job. He's also a catcher. And the final player to mention, man, LSU's got some talent, is that Brody Dros. Brody's a, a sulfur native, sulfur Louisiana, 6'2", about 210. Brody's also an outfielder. He's got a lot of power. He's also a guy that could have signed for the um, MLB. But because of COVID-19, because of um, the lack of money, instead of signing in the second or third round, and he didn't go in the second, third, because he told him he was going to college, Brody's going to be a heck of a player at LSU. He's a guy that just when it all comes together, he might end up being your DH by midseason. <clears throat> it might not be – it might be him – um, you know, and Gavin Dugas might battle that DH position the whole season, I predict. But Brody's an outfielder, and if somebody slumps an outfield, he can end up taking somebody's – I mean, I, I think Cade Beloso is going to be the starter at left field. I don't think he'll get beat out. Uh, Dylan Cruz at right, I don't think he'll get beat out. But Giovanni in center, that's the guy that has a job for as of today. And I know Maneri would like him to become a good hitter. If he struggles at the plate, then again they could make they could they can put some other players out there. Brody might be that guy, but he's six foot two, two ten. He was he was a really good football player early on in high school too. He's probably the most talented freshman coming in that hasn't hit his stride yet. That it hasn't all come together, but he hit some home runs over the summer, and he's got so much talent. He played at Barb, you know Barb High School, um, but. We'll talk about pitchers maybe Friday of this week, and the staff is loaded because there's some carryover with extra scholarships. It's a one-time extra scholarship deal where um, they don't count against the total, and so LSU can carry. I think they're going to carry four or five players over the total because uh, the NCAA gave an extra year to some of these baseball players, just like all sports. And so that makes the LSU pitching staff really deep. The key is here. If LSU does reach their potential this year, the problem is Vanderbilt's just as talented as LSU, and they've got Rocker back as a pitcher who's, who's one of the best pitchers. Kumar Rocker, who throws 97 miles an hour, and they won the national championship. I mean, he's, he's dominant, and then they have another dominant pitching staff and a very talented hitting staff, so... You know, Vandy's going to be tough. Florida's going to be talent. Arkansas is going to be good. Mississippi State's going to be good. Ole Miss is going to be good. Uh, Tennessee's going to be good. Kentucky's going to be good. So it's going to be tough, man. South Carolina's going to be good. Um, Missouri's got a lot of talent coming back in baseball. So it's not a given that LSU wins the SEC. I'm just saying, on paper, I think this is one of the most talented teams that Maneri's ever had. If they can just stick together, and, and nobody leaves a team between now and the start of the first game, or everybody kind of sticks together as a team. I mean, they, it's all about hitting now. I mean, LSU's had the pitching the last seven years to win three national championships. They just didn't have the hitting. They couldn't hit the, – the bats went cold two or three times in Omaha under Maneri. They just didn't have the talent at the plate. And even when they had Bregman, they – he, he went cold in Omaha when he went his two years. So it's just important uh, that LSU becomes a good hitting team. They're going to, and, and Friday we'll talk about the great pitching they have again. Returning, importantly, Devin Fontenot's coming back. We'll talk about Devin and the rest of the staff in Jaden Hill, the big talent pitcher from Arkansas for net for this Friday. I hope everybody enjoyed the show. Um, 
our guest Wednesday is going to be a great guest. Uh, we, I don't want to share it yet, but it's going to be a great story about a kid that's overcome a lot to play high school football in Louisiana. And we'll have, we'll have this kid's father. We'll introduce who they are on Wednesday, Friday. We'll have another big-time guest. And uh, I hope everybody again is having a great Monday. I know we're all going, we're all back to work. I worked all weekend, um, but I hope everybody is having a wonderful Monday, and we will see you on Wednesday. Thanks for listening to the Sports Scouting Report podcast with Lee Brookings.